Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic, which is lasting a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> but it's winter time, and of course, it's dark outside, and we can't all be playing with our horses all night long, at least on, on the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so it's a great way to do webinars and kind of keep touch with my guests. Um, tonight, my guest is Ida Hammer, and this is her fourth webinar with me, and I'm really excited to have her back because we haven't talked in a few, well, we haven't had a webinar in a few months we've talked. Um, but uh, I'll let Ida introduce herself a little bit, and then we'll get into her topic tonight, which is the frog in the digital cushion. Very excited about this. So hi, Ida. Thanks for joining me again. Hey, Wendy. Glad to be here. All right. So, so hi, Ida. Yeah, just kind of give everybody a, a you know, the ticky tour of, of uh, your, your background and, and uh, so hi everybody, you know, I'm a Wendy fan too. So I'm like, and she's like, webinars are fun for all of us. So it's, it's just a lot of fun. But um, so I'm a genuine hoof geek, horse geek, and I've had horses forever. I'm like a lot of the people on here are my students. So they've, they've heard this a time or two, but um, okay. I've had horses forever, done some really stupid things, skeptical about a lot of things, but um, trimming horses. I have, um, I think I'm up over 130 graduates now. Um, with um, people trimming and using this style of work on the horses and um and we really like the the people the, my, my graduates we're all of a like mind really so like we we really use and put into practice the sure foot pads and the stuff that we do uh -oh. it's not just about the feet so it's about everything so ida just what got so, you into doing trimming so well, again, we, we've had horses forever. And so Ada and I got a cutting horse in the 80s. Um, she was diagnosed with navicular disease early on. Like uh, she went, hindsight's 20-20, but was, lots of things had caused her problems, not her feet, but we didn't know that. And so she got diagnosed with navicular disease between the age of four and five. And we did everything that they told us to do with her. I'm like, we, you know, we did the heart bar shoes and I socks a print. And I can't let my dog see that because they'll be up here in the in the camera. Well, he too. was the one making noise, and he will probably make noise during this webinar because he wants something like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so, just so you know, if you hear yacht crying, crying, it's it's Buster the dash cam cat. Okay. <laughs> oh, this could get interesting. He meows, and our dogs will bark. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they're gonna have their own webinar. Um, so we did everything that they told us to do with with seeker like with heart bar shoes i had barrier science text we did everything i saxophone and she never really got better ada worked for the vet and he said you know she's your million dollar horse so we're just like we just chalked it up to that's what happens well anybody that knows or has talked to me at all knows that um ada always buys pretty horses they don't have to be sound or sane but they can be pretty so <laughs> so she she picked out a really pretty blue roan who is an amazing horse but um, we, we didn't do a vet check, anything that would make any sense at all. So we got her. And so um, first off, we went for our trail ride, like mm, probably two weeks after we got her. And they didn't really tell us that she pulled back. So so we just had her hitched up to the hitching rail. Ada was getting ready. She's like pulling back, throwing herself on the ground, making these Mustangy bellowing noises. And so Ada goes, I don't think I went that horse. You can have her. So I <laughs> so <laughs> so i'm like i personally have lots of pretty horses now <laughs> so so unfortunately she didn't but pull back if she was bellowing that was kind of a really she was she got a temper she's a temper little horse but uh, so um i did i took her and i'm like and her name is bobby we nicknamed her the bobinator because that's kind of her personal personality but so um, I spent a week at the Pirelli Center in Florida with her and we did some really cool things. We were like getting ready to do some bridalist riding and some really neat, fun things. And then when we came back home, she was three-legged lame, just, you know, it seemed like out of the blue. So hindsight's 2020. There's a lot of things that were incorporated into what had happened with that, but you only see the surface things when you're not digging deeper, which like we've learned to dig deeper. And I always tell my people to dig deeper, but so we took her to the University of Illinois and she has a scar on her left hip, which she was very reactive to. She's had that since she was a youth. And, uh, but they kept telling us that she was lame on her right front. Well, they did uh, radiographs and they found a, a large bone spur on her navicular bone. And so, you know, 
and we didn't get a vet check and she was fine up until this point and all this kind of stuff. And she was only six at the time. Mm. And uh, so they started writing with their regular stuff where they're like, oh, you gotta like, you, you gotta do heart bar shoes and wedge pads and isoxaprine. And we really suggest an erectomy for her because um, she's so bad. And Ada's like, well, we did that with the first horse and nothing ever happened that way it's supposed to. So she said, either find a better way or, well, she started off with either put her to sleep now. I'm like, no, I'm not putting her to sleep because she's a pretty awesome horse. Or find her another home. Well, if you came to our house, we have 10 horses here. No, nothing ever leaves. <laughs> and, Hotel California, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's why I tell people, it's like, you're like, you can come anytime you want, but you can't ever leave. But um, so uh, she's, or find a better way. And so I did. And that's when I joined the AA, AANHCP. And um, I started getting my hoof education with them. And then um, as that branched off, I'm like, I stayed with the American Hoof Association. Um, I've taught classes for the AANHCP. And um, Wait, a -A American Association of? At, at, back in the day, it used to be American Association of Natural Hoof Care Practitioners. It stands for something else now because he's changed it. But that's what it was back in the day. Pete Ramey was there and that kind of stuff. And it, some of the stuff went south and it separated off. I was with the American Hope Association until it folded uh, last year. Oh. And then, um, so I taught for the AA in HCP. And so I just continued to, like, for a while, I just continued to do horse owner classes because um, people don't have to be a full time trimmer to learn about their hooves. And, and honestly, it's like I have lots of horse owners taking care of their horse's feet because they know them better than anybody else. Yep. And they do, you just, you know, your horse. I'm like, you can see subtle changes because if you try to tell a professional, like, so, so say you, I want to use your horse, Al, for example, mm -hmm. but say Al comes in and he's not limping. Nothing, nothing is apparently wrong as far as like physically being able to see something. He's not limping. He's not, he's not seemingly in pain, but his demeanor is not the same. And so trying to explain that to another professional, say, I don't know what's wrong with my horse, but he's just not right. It's much easier for you to detect something that's just off on your horse, even if it's just a little bit and he might not be painful. So horse owners really, really like embraced it and so I, I taught lots of horse owners but then just like um most of the horse owners that come to the class they get kind of addicted to this and so that like I, I just laugh we do intros at every class and I'm asked you know I ask them what their goals are and stuff and and somebody will always say I'm like I'm just going to trim my own horses and I'm like I always tell them for now <laughs> <laughs> Because like, it never fails because like once the, the problem is, is the world is so used to seeing abnormal abnormality that they make it normal. And so when you start seeing your own horse looking so much better and feeling so much better, it's it, you can't stop looking at all the rest of stuff. So you're going to start looking at things that in a different way. And it makes it hard for you to go to competitions and stuff without, you know, really looking like. But, it, you know, I think I think you really hit upon the the crux of the matter is that, you know, when we're at the, if you will, the mercy of someone else doing our horse, we're on their schedule and what they say. And, you know, mm -hmm. I got driven into doing my own horses years ago when a farrier put a nail through the sole of my horse's foot and he was lame for six weeks, never abscessed. And we didn't know it was through his sole until I finally got another farrier to come back and pull the shoe. And then we couldn't put another shoe on. And then I was just done. And yeah. I was like, I, I, I'm going, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to figure this out. And I was really fortunate because my horse lives in Joyce Harmon's barn. And so I had someone there to help guide me. But, you know, this is something that I think a lot of people struggle with is, is, you know, what if you're, you know, you live somewhere where you only have one guy or one woman and what if they're not doing a good job or what, you know, you're, it's such a, uh, a difficult position to be at the mercy of someone else with your animal. Yeah, it is. And it's scary. And it's like in, in back from the olden days was like, just depending on other people, you know, like, you know, your animal better than anybody else. And I like, and I'm just not much for depending on somebody else. Like we did that. We did that with our first horse, you know? So I should go back to mention the fact that the first navicular horse, once I learned how to do things correctly, I'm like, she was as sound as she's ever been. She died a sound horse at 29. So like wow, so for, that's awesome. for 14 years, I'm like, we were, we were spending lots of money trying to do the right thing. And it still wasn't the right thing. And, and so that all those things add up. And so I always tell people like for, for myself and my, and my graduates and my students know this and they do it as well, but no matter what we do, no matter what 
like like we can do everything theoretically perfect but if the horse doesn't like it it's still wrong and 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 you and all of us have got to be okay with that and the fact that the owner needs to feel confident that they can or comfortable that they can tell us hey you know what like uh, what, whatever you did the last time the horse just wasn't as good as they usually are and that gives us a piece of what that horse needs as his individual self so and that should be okay with anybody always and like when people like none of us get none of you know none of my people get um all beside themselves if somebody says hey you know you made my horse sore because like, all of us do i'm like there's always little oopses that you're gonna you're gonna yeah, do absolutely. something that's not agreeable with the horse but what's what's wrong is if you don't do something not to do that again so you have to you have to have the information not to do that and so we all have open communications with our clients and the client and we wouldn't look at anybody with two heads if they said hey my horse just didn't feel good you know it doesn't he's not lame but he's just there's something different right. and nobody in our group would look at that as we and Ida, don't you also think that in the past, I would say 10 years, and maybe you're gonna say a different time frame, that we've had uh, a lot more information about the foot become into the uh, more common, not into the body of knowledge that's available to people. I mean, yes. I don't recall when I, you know, I mean, I I won't say how long I, how old I am or how long I've been around, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall having this kind of information available even when I started, and maybe it was there when I started working on my own horse, because I, Daisy Bicking actually was my, I was, she was my student. And so when I, after I had already started working on my horses, I met Daisy and then she helped me uh, work with Al. She got me started doing Al. Um, but I had already been doing Andy for a while. But I think that it seems to me, and maybe it's just my perspective, that there's a lot more information available for people to learn about the foot. Yeah, there is. And I think, I think it came about. And so, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but I think for the longest time that horseshoeing was like horseshoeing or farriery was, um, it was a hardcore, like uh, big time male occupation thing where, you know, and I'm not, not saying that's a bad thing, but so it was just always, always accepted that, okay, they're going to take care of like blacksmithery. I'm like, that, that comes from ages, like ages ago, not just yeah. anytime soon. So then, you know, no one you know we just always thought it was left up to the mechanics of it you know as far as like the iron and and on that kind of thing and like and i i fell into that tr trusting like like horseshoers all all of my early life it's like that's what we did we did race horses and stuff and you just did that and so there was there was textbooks out at the time and i'm like and i i, I got those i bought the like trying to help our first horse but the problem is 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 it was stuck it was a science that was stuck because you know, nothing ever changed. And like, and then when you have a huge community, I'm like, and the horse world's funny like that anyways, but if you have a huge community of people that have always done it this way, to get them to look outside of the box and be a pioneer is is hard. So, so you're right. Um, so, you know, like I have to, you know, even though like Jamie Jackson was the one I, I started with him and, and he was a pioneer. I'm like in uh, those guys that they start that, 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 that does something, something out of the box so that just enough information to get all of us addicted to it, to where that we know that there's more information. It just opens the door for us. Cause back when I started, it's like, I'm like, it was, it was so funny because it's like, you know, I was the only woman around doing it. It was still a bunch of male farriers and they're like, Oh, it'll pass. It's a fad. And they just thought I was a hippie and, you know, and then, and, but then what happens is, is then we all get addicted to it. And then we get hooked up with like Dr. Bowker and Dr. Taylor and Mike and Pete Ramey, all those guys that have their, their pioneers and their progressive pioneers that like say, Hey, you know, this is the way it's always been done. But like, what if we do just one thing different? What if we do this different? And then, so then we start gaining knowledge and, and, and over the past, you know, 16, 18 years, it's unbelievable how much more like, and, and because of that, I really believe because of that horseshoeing, progressive horseshoers have gotten better because um, I, I had read a post from a horseshoer just not that long ago on Facebook. He was talking about the differences in be between barefoot trimmers and horse horseshoers. And he said, he said it comes to his attention and he is, he's a long time horseshoer, but it came to his attention that the barefoot people seem to pay more of attention to the whole horse. Whereas um, the old school, farriers were paying more attention to how to wield the best iron 
And so he said, it's time for us to like uh, step out of our box and, you know, get with the whole horse. So piece by piece, I'm like, you know, it was really offset in the beginning. I'm like, I think we've made huge gains. It, it certainly seems that way. And I, you know, I, I think it's been, to me, it seems like the past 20 years is when this has really started to change and really, um, and Last now it's, it's like a ball rolling downhill. It's picking up steam. Because now, now I, I can remember, and I just, I still kind of laugh about this in a way, because back when um, I first started with the barefoot stuff in the natural hoof care, you know, uh, Pete Ramey always talked about subclinical laminitis and, and, uh, and like, and, you know, Bob Bacher knew that and De uh, Deb Taylor knew that. And she talked about it. And like, we talked about it all the time, subclinical laminitis, but it was never, it was never, you know, when you said that to most regional veterinarians, they're like, looked at you like you had two heads. But then just recently, and like, and, and this is like, oh gosh, they, they were talking about subclinical laminitis uh, as early as 2004 or five. And, um, but it wasn't really published in the medical journals, I think. And I, I don't know the date for sure, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't published in the medical journals, the veterinary journals until like maybe 2012 or 13. I'm like, wow. it took them that long to actually embrace the fact that there is a subclinical laminitis. But it's hard to, you know, it's, it's, it, it's in the last 10 years, I think it's doubled speed. Yeah. Yeah, actually, because I, I mean, I've forgotten that I went to, I don't know if you know, um, Mark Plumley. He's out in Washington know. State. Gene Ovenick. I met Gene Ovenick in, in uh, 99 or 2000. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because Mark Plumley was having what was called Soundfest. And mm -hmm. they were, uh, Mark and Jean were really good friends. And Diane Isbell was there, Dr. Isbell. I got to get her on. I, she's agreed. I got to get her come. Um, but, you know, that that's, I hate to think how many years ago that was, um, because it feels like yep. it's a lot shorter. Um, but that's 30 years. That's 30 years of bringing forward change. And it's only seems like in the past maybe 10 or so years that this whole movement is really catching steam, yeah. which is fabulous. I'm excited about it. I'm like, it's like the number of people coming to classes now. I'm like, I've had several veterinarians. I'm like, uh, get on board. I'm like, I've, I've got my um, first certified veterinarian uh, uh, practitioner in uh, Uvalde, Texas, Dr. Tracy Colvin. And um, she's been amazing. And like, so it's, it's just, it's really, I'm like, and I trim for several veterinarians as well, but it's just really picking up speed. It's awesome. All right. So now that we have talked about the industry as a whole, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think you have your laptop on your lap. I do. Okay, so it just gets a little unsteady and I have to put the cat out because he's gonna, um, so <laughs> you get your PowerPoint started, I'll get the cat. Okay. Okay, he, he, um, <laughs> he wanted to go out. I, I'm not run by cats, no. <laughs> <laughs> Fibber. Yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to, let's see if I can do this right. Can you see, what do you see at this point? Nothing. So did you go down to, oh, wait, there we go. Can you see it now? Yep. Guys, nice. remember how the first, remember how the first webinar you had to like practically hold my hand to the whole thing? It's, it's okay. I, I taught a lot of people how to do Zoom and now they're, they're very proficient. So uh, I, I wouldn't say. I haven't made it to that part yet, but like at least hey, you got this up for this far. Oh, I know. Right. So you just have to play from okay. start. Okay, so is it later? So like so the frog in the digital, I'm like, I'm obsessed wait, wait. with start your slide. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you got it? Yep, now it is. <laughs> okay, so I'm obsessed with everything, obviously, but um, so my current obsession is with the the frog and the digital cushion and the CCU ligament and and negative angles and that kind of stuff. So, um, so I I thought I would just go slow with this stuff, like start with the frog and the digital cushion, so I can talk about this. And then, at that, I'm going to go through some of this stuff, but at the end. I'm like, towards the end, I'm like, I want to be able to relate it to where, um, cause so you and I are always having a, a conversation about what do you think makes sure foot work? And we kind of like, we're like, we really don't know, but it does. And so, so because I'm like fascinated by it and um, obsessed, I'm like, I try to figure out ways that makes it why I'm like, and there's lots of whys, but 
So because I'm obsessed with the frog and the digital cushion, I'm going to talk about those for a little bit and then like lace that into what I'm kind of thinking about surefoot with it. Awesome. So, so on, um, can you, if I, if I do this with my arrow, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, cool. So, so the frog and the digital cushion. So when you look at, this is the inside of the foot and some of these might be, they're not really gross, but they might be kind of raw. So I'm like, I apologize about that. But um, so this, all this material where my arrow is on that left picture, all that material is a digital cushion. And I'm like, and then this is a nice healthy frog. And so one thing that we'll notice is notice this right here. This is the little home for the frog's spine or stay, however you want to call it. But that has a huge part to the horse's soundness. And then if you, this, all this material that's underneath here is digital cushion. It's underneath the frog and part of the heel bulbs right there. And so then this is the one that we took the whole capsule apart. So this is missing all the bones, but you can see the frog spine. It's called a spine or the stay, however you want to put that. But the mass of that fits comfortably into this frog. And that's what gives the horse a lot of its support. And so like at one, you know, at the class, and um, I think you got to do this too in Tennessee, but when we do this and we do the beginner class, I'm like, we actually peel it off and you stand in this and you actually feel how much uh, strength there is to that. And you actually stand on it yourself. And then people behind you can see with your body weight, how much you're expanding the hoof. So that makes a, it makes a huge difference. I lost my arrow. Here we go. No, so, so, so when that sits in, so when you have the sole and your frog spine here, and then this part sets in the foot, you have the digital cushion then all in here as well. So that's like, so this is just to give you an idea at this point, you know, what we're looking at and we're looking at the frog and the digital cushion. So your right hand picture is actually the hoof capsule removed from yeah. the sole. Yes. This, this is the wall. Okay. And then this is the sole. And so okay. then the bones would go in here, but it's just a, it just gives you an idea of where everything fits and stops. So, so this is like nice, healthy, good frog. And you can see the central sulcus is where the frog's spine lives. So this central sulcus in the frog, like that little diamond area, that's where if you go back to this, that's where this little guy lives. He tucks in there and I'm like, and it makes a really tight, smooth machine that actually keeps part of the, the foot together. Okay. So let me go to the next one. So if you look at it from, uh, if you look at the digital cushion in the frog in relation to the distal limb, so the one on the left, this is a three month old foal and you can look at his digital cushion like it's right underneath the frog, but um, it's not much yet at that point. I mean, it it's not formed, it's, it's just baby, like it's like chicken fat, it's not much there. And what forms it, what causes it to get tougher and stronger is uh, movement, proper movement to land on the heel first and break over and, and have constant pressure and release of that, that tissue that's in there actually makes it more robust and, and strong. And so, um, and then if you look at the one on the right, this is so this, the, the blue is the, the line where the frog is at. And then the red is all the digital cushion that's in there. And so you can see how much, and so if you look at my arrow, so the uh, deep digital flexor tendon that's right here goes underneath your navicular bone. So see all this material under here protects that navicular bone. Okay. And I, you know, I, I remember taking Bob Bowker's course, I thought, is it two years ago this spring? I guess so. And when he showed me a picture of the digital cushion, I realized, and he showed a picture of the human heel, mm -hmm. the similarity in the structure with this kind of baffling um, and if anybody's, you know, like, like I had terrible heel pain in my right foot, at, long story after surgery, blah, blah. Um, but that it's like those things get crushed and they're not nice and fat and full. And so then they're thin. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah. Yes. So they're either, so a couple of things can happen. And um, this is, uh, this is where like my fascination is really going crazy with it. But so a couple of things can happen. Like, first of all, I'm like, you have to have movement and, and turn out and all that kind of stuff for this baby over here to develop his foot. But even after you develop a foot, incorrect, incorrect trimming lifestyle and diet can, can actually still collapse the digital cushion. And what's so cool about the digital cushion and what's so fascinating, and this is, this is where I'm like gone bananas over, is um, there's inside that digital cushion, there's actually a ligament and it's called the CCU ligament. It's, uh, it stands for computochondral ungular ligament. Wait, wait, it, wait, say that again. CCU, it's computochondral ungular ligament. Okay. And so what's interesting and unique is um, that was in anatomy books, veterinary anatomy books until the 40s. 
and then after 1940, I think 1940, they took it out and they just lumped the digital cushion all as one piece and they didn't really talk about the CCU anymore. And um, so uh, is like, and I don't know like which one did it first because like there's a host of progressive veterinarians that have discovered it, rediscovered it, not discovered it, but rediscovered it. You know, Dr. Bowker is the first one I heard about it from. Um, he talked about it at length at the 2015 ECIR conference. But um, uh, Dr. Taylor is well aware of it, and she talks about that quite a bit. And um, Dr. Johanna Reimer talks about it quite a bit. Um, she's got actually Joanna's got some Johanna's got some really cool video on her Facebook page. Um, so her Facebook page is Rost Rost Horseshoes R O S T. But she's got footage of uh, the CCL a uh, CCU ligament in um, in action on her page. And so that's what gave us the idea um, for our advanced professionals class that we did in Texas um, as we dissected feet and, and actually then looked at the ligament and we looked at it under lights. I've got some pictures of it on here tonight, but oh, cool. um, so it's, it's really, so when you think about this and Dr. Bowker described it as this hammock, you know, it's like a hammock system that goes from, uh, from ungular cartilage, from collateral cartilage to collateral, collateral cartilage in the foot. And so if you think about how it makes it really makes good sense because if you just have a fibrous tissue that's underneath the foot with really no structure base to it, I mean, it really doesn't have a, it doesn't have a lot. There's not really nothing to hold it together. It just would be squishy and doing all of its thing. But if you add these ligaments that go through there that actually hold it like a netting, um, it makes more sense when they when that attaches to the cartilages on each side. So then you can start to really put in your mind together this the suspensory apparatus that that holds the whole back part, part of the palmar or plantar part of the foot in place and does and protects the DDFT and the navicular bone and it's just it's crazy cool what you do, but then so like the horses that that have had good digital cushion and then you find that they're starting to have problems. A lot of those horses that happens because. Um, either A, they've gotten too long of toes, which shifts, shifts the sense of balance from the uh, center of rotation to where um, more of it, like you go to an, an abnormally amount in front of the center of rotation, which puts unusual pressure on the back. And it starts to like, there's too much weight on the, on the, uh, the digital cushion and the CCU ligament, because then it starts to break it down. So it never gets a break. The whole idea is pressure and release, not constant pressure. So, so that's part A to it. And then like, then, then you'll get other, other times that will weaken it is because you, like they'll, they'll put like, I kind of laugh because Dr. Becker calls them peripherally loading devices. But I'm like, if you put, if you put a horseshoe on a foot that, that does not, not allow them to have frog contact, um, then you start losing the stimuli to actually keep that into a healthy, a healthy me mechanism too. So you can lose your digital cushion and your, your like everything starts to go south because then your, your hill bulbs start to prolapse and they go out backwards and then you have no structure to the back part of your foot whatsoever. Any, any questions about that so far? Okay. I don't think so. Okay. No, nobody's asked so, one. If you have a question, put it in the Q and A or the chat. That's how I handle them. <laughs> okay. So I'm like, so we took this picture at the, um, at our advanced professionals class. I'm like, it was just thawing out. So I'm like, it was a perfect picture. I'm like these are just really thin sagittal slices. And I'm like, and I put a note on this one because this this horse was laminitic at death. You can see the lamina where my arrow is is not is not correct. I'm like, it's it's pulling away. But um, but when you look at it, when we when we started a thought, you can see all the. I I like this picture just to kind of give you an idea of the blood feed to the foot, because I'm like it kind of stopped the like it froze the blood in place, and so you can see how that's that's feeding the foot, and you can see some of the vascularity that's feeding the cushion. So this is just another shot, but this one starts to so this shot. You can actually start to see, you see these fine little lines in here. That's yeah. in the digital cushion. Like, so, so when you start to look at that and you're looking at how well webbed that is and how supportive that, that is, or can be if, if everything is right, then it just makes like, cause this is your DDFT here and your navicular bone can. So if you see, if you can imagine these holding up your network of fiber cartilage, in, in supporting this this tendon as it's going into the coffin bone and then the, the navicular bone. I'm like, and if you didn't have this, how much concussion you'd get on these very same apparatuses. And it's those little little uh, lines that I was talking about, those fibrous lines, that's exactly what the human heel design looks like is with is that, those little, yeah. I mean, oh, it's yeah. fascinating actually, the similarity. I, I, it I've, is. 
Especially when I had heel pain, okay? (laughs) Well, exactly. So it's like, you know, like it's really, it's like, it sucks to be us to have some of the same things that happens to the horses, but it's kind of good to know because it's like when you have heel pain, you know how it changed your gait. Yep. You know how you yep. you'd place your foot, and then the the more incorrectly that you walk because something hurts, the more something else hurts, and it can really give you a good wraparound about. Like, when I just had my knee surgery. It's like so. Like it's like the stifle in the horse. So I was like everything that I did. Uh, I'm like I was like conscious of what happens with the horses when they have stifle problems and why that they don't like to go down hills like just straight down the hill because you know like it's it's relative to what to what we do. And then oddly enough that when I had the surgery in it and I actually repaired it, I'm like, I had to, I had to teach myself not to limp because um, yeah. I had limped for so long. So like horses do the exact same thing. Even like if you have heel pain with, with um, if this is underdeveloped and you have heel pain and you finally get it developed and where it's good, sometimes you have to help them. You taught me that about my frozen shoulder. So you have to teach them as well, not to limp because like the, it's hard, it's hard ingrained it's a habit you def- you form the habit of limping and then it what is a habit it's unconscious right and so you don't even know you're limping and then somebody looks at you and goes you're limping and you're like what i am you know because it's now a pattern of movement resulting from pain even if the pain is gone um yep. and horses and people have habit patterns and they have huge amount of cerebellum dedicated to habitual you know patterns of movement which is how yep. they're designed um, so yeah, we have to rehab them both. We have a question. Um, I think it's a good time to ask it. It says, what are the chances of rehabbing prolapsed, prolapsed digital cushion and collateral cartilages after a lifetime of shoes and now caudal failure? So um, just in the last two years, um, we went down with Deb Taylor, a lot of us did, and um, was working with the formal hoof molds and using some polymer to um, uh, polyurethane to um, actually rebuild the structure of the foot and like out of all things that we've used, it's been pretty successful so the glue on shoes were helping like before we knew about the the form of molds that they make um before that we were using glue on shoes and we was making progress but it doesn't do the same as like what the um what the form of program does because the form of program actually pushes the um prolapse back underneath where it goes and holds it there so it can it can be supported while it's developing so um my glass is always like three quarters full so it would have to be like we've had good luck rehabbing horses that um the mri and the their vet reports was like an inch thick of all the doom and gloom and um they're back that my uh, one one in particular just recently was like um does it, he, he was cleared sound to to go back to work wow and um and so, dr Balker uh, always talks about the mix i think it's mixoid material it's in that digital cushion that's just mm-hmm. waiting it's like stem cells just waiting yeah. to be woken up it is it's crazy and it just needs a little help and so you just like the biggest thing is is to be able to support it but yet stimulate it and so that's where like there's a fine line because sometimes we had uh, we had tools to stimulate it but nothing to support it so if it's still in the wrong place and it still can't work properly it's hard to support it it's, it's hard to stimulate it correctly, but excuse me. But if you can, if you can stimulate while supporting, it's a win-win. And and uh, like we've had a lot of horses this past year that was that was deemed like like all of my students around the country that were doing that, um, they were deemed that they were not they were hopeless and they're back to work. Awesome. It's so. it, when you take the stress off, it's amazing how quickly something can recover. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, what's important is, is taking the stress off, but still using it, which sounds like an oxymoron, but, um, so you you have to, you have to put something in place that will still stimulate it, but that takes the brunt of the hard work while it heals. And so it's, it's a, it's a pickly, like, but it it can be done. It just has to be done correctly. Mm So this is one of my favorite pictures that we did. So you can actually, we put this, what we did, this is like uh, an eighth of an inch slice, a sagittal slice. And then we put a flashlight underneath it so you can actually see like right through the digital cushion. This is looking through it so you can see these little fine, fine little ligament lines. And then that's the, the DDFT there in the navicular bone. But um, we do all kinds of experiments at our, our, our professionals class. And so we did this. So 
No, I had told you about it, but I don't think I had showed it to you. So I don't think no. I did. That's really cool. So this is a quote from Dr. Bakker. And so um, I took this out of one of his research papers because I'm always trying to wrap my head around what is it about the sure foot pad that, that works? So we've looked at the structure of the foot and, and we looked at the structure of the digital cushion and the frog and, and when it's weighted. So when um, one of the things he says is uh, different parts of the foot will be loaded during each phase of the limb and stride and then from the initial ground contact. But, um, but then I'm gonna go fast forward a little bit to the lame horse, the normal sequ sequence pattern of movement may be potentially be altered resulting in different receptors being activated. So this is where we went back about to, to develop the digital cushion is if you have a lame horse, they're going to alter their gait, which will alter what is getting perceived as, as um, uh, uh, receptors. So like, because they're not gonna land on the same foot, just like you didn't wanna land on your heel when you had heel pain. Mm -hmm. So if you could offer that to the horse and let them do that, that makes helps them develop it. But so then when I wanted to bring that back to the sure foot pads, so like, so these are just examples. And so um, if you think about the receptors that he's talking about in the foot, and there are several receptors, I didn't uh, quote all those down or write those all down for today, but there's several receptors that do all different things in the foot. And there's a huge amount of receptors in the back part of the foot. And this horse, like this, is, like this isn't the same horse as Playboy. Playboy is just showing off because he's pretty. But, <laughs> but um, this is a different horse. This horse chose to place his foot there. And so if a horse has heel pain, which, and, and this is almost uh, probably 100%, I'd say at least 99.9% .9 true. If, uh, oh, my internet connection is having problems. You guys hear me okay? No, you're still good. You're still good. Okay. It just uh, had a little warning that went across there. Um, so, but the cool part is, is if you look at this horse, he's choosing to put his heel on that. So it's, it's a pressure related uh, stimuli for the receptors. And, like, and then I've got another quote from Dr. Bakker, exactly what's happening when that's, ha when that's happening. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward a few slides and I'll come back. Okay. Let me go. Okay, so this one. So, so this is the part that this is where it makes me think this is what's happening with the sure foot. So, um, uh, substance P binds to the tachykinin receptors of the endothelial lining of the micro vessels in the palmar foot. So, uh, what that that what that's meaning is is it to the linings of the of the the palmar foot. So, um, that horse that horse that was putting its foot on the the sure foot pad as it was, he's he's choosing to put pressure but uh, the right kind of pressure on the back part of his foot. As he's doing that, I'm like, because I'm like, it's, 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 in, it's acting on the tachykinin receptors of the, of the, of the micro vessels in the palmar foot. So doing that causes the release of nitric oxide. And by doing that, the, so then the small molecule has the potent effect on small vessels and dilating them to provide more cushion support for the caudal foot. So, so the horse would have heel pain or even he could have more than just heel pain, but he chooses to put his foot or heel on the pad that stimulates a substance P to stimulate the, 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 the receptors that's going to cause the release of nitric oxide. The nitric oxide has the effect on the small blood vessels in the foot. And like, and then by dilating them, you provide more cushion support for the, for the caudal foot, energy dissipation, more perfusion in the foot. So, at the moment they're standing there, not only is their proprioception being challenged, but it's it's causing that moment that they're there is causing a release of these uh, of these things that are actually doing all the things we need to heal the foot. I'm kind of babbling, but I get excited about it. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's just really cool because I haven't read this this piece of Bowker's work, so that's just really cool. So 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 at least when horses compared to standing on hard surfaces, at other times the neurotransmitters can promote the health and the well-being of the immunosystem. So not only are when they stand on the, the surefoot pads, is it possible that they're they're actually they're stimulating the uh, substance P, starting this chain of events that creates more nitric oxide. Not only are they doing that, but like that's actually helping them with their immunosystem by increasing the manufacture of the, the proteins and immunoglobulins and et cetera. Wow. So, and it's stuff that you can't actually see happening, but you can feel happening. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but this is why I'm like, without a fail, I'm like people that have laminated horses or foundered horses. I'm like, I want them to be standing on the surefoot pads. I'm like, um, and you and I had talked about that before. And, you know, part of it is like, we know it works. We don't know how it works. So I'm like, I have to know more about why it works. So I'm like, we just know it doesn't like, and 
and I'm sure there's not just this reason why, but this is a huge piece for me to put it together because of uh, the stimulation that's happening as they're standing there. Yeah, and it's just, somebody's just put in that her horse stands like that with the, with the heel on the pad toe off and has had an issue with that front of her hoof when we were in a process that they're investigating. So in other words, they've seen this pattern in a horse with a foot problem, that that's mm -hmm. how the horse is choosing to stand on the pad. Yeah, it's crazy because they'll choose. I'm like, if, if you give them a choice about the sure foot pads, they'll pick where they need to. They'll they'll pick where they need to put it, and it's, and it's not always just about their feet. So I'm like, so I'm a foot geek, but I'm like, but they they can have other problems in their body that maybe they do not need to do that part of their foot for whatever that reason, but they need to do something else for their body. But um, that's why I broke it down because I'm like, I could go on for hours about all the things that I see. But so if I break it down to the frog and the digital cushion tonight, then I don't have to get all weirded out and just. Okay. Focus. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so I'm going to back up a few slides then. So again, so he talked about uh, the sensory and um, 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 that, that they gather from their feet and like in their space and time. And I'm like, and it goes on more, more the article talked about, I'm like, that that very feeling of the proprioception in the feet and as they're touching the ground where it's a hard surface or a cushion surface it's actually giving them uh neurotransmitted feedback as to how fast that they're supposed to be going um front limbs versus hind limbs which gets me onto a whole different subject with like angles and stuff with um like negative angles but i won't go into that tonight but so if you so i wanted to go to the next slide sorry I've tried to um, somebody that just away. that same person commented about the duration and how short it is that the horse does that but i think that this makes sense is that the horses are gonna you know they're going to step off of that when they when they've stimulated the sensor because you know if you stimulate a sensor too long it start stops losing its function exactly right exactly um, and, like, you know, yeah it will, it will be their it would be the new normal it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a sensation anymore right which I'm always trying to help people understand that duration is, it, it, you know, there's, it's not about the horse standing on the pad for a long period of time. It's about the time the horse needs to stand on the pad. Yes. Yes. And it's and like, and, and they'll change the, they'll change it up too, as far as like what they're doing and that kind of stuff. So um, this might be like, and you tell me if it's okay or not. So um, about some of the stuff that we're testing. Oh, that's fine. Uh, okay. So, um, so, we're trying to, we're doing, um, so we're doing some tests with a, um, a best test product for um, some of my grads are, tr are trying it out um, for the Surefoot pads to be um, in boots, like boot pads. Do you want me to talk about and it so, first so they know yes. what you're talking about? Okay, so Ida and I got together and one of the things she told me was she would really like to have our materials as boot inserts to different types of therapy boots. So we have been working on developing those. We're still beta testing. We're still working out um, the, the things we have to work out is the thickness and a couple other uh, issues that we came across when horses are in them for a long period of time. But basically um, it's, it's gonna be a much thinner than your standard surefoot pad because you're not trying to create instability, you're trying to create comfort. So uh, by making the pads thinner than the standard surefoot pads, which are typically two inches thick, except for the slants and the physio pads, right? But the standard pad is two inches thick. By making them thinner, you're not gonna get that kind of instability, but you're gonna get the comfort. And so we're working with the different density pads to kind of figure out uh, which densities and how thick those densities, uh, primarily working with inch and half inch thickness. Um, and so far we've been sending Ida a bunch of firm and soft, um, a few medium, but nobody seems to come back with me with, to me with any data on the medium at this point. Um, but certainly we've got data on the firm and soft. And so that's what she's talking about is um, we're beta testing, we're prototyping, we've been sending them out to Ida's grad students who are willing to give us feedback. Please don't everybody flood me with, I'll test, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. um, have to keep all, all my people under control. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it takes a lot to, to create the prototypes because we have to do them by hand and then we have to send them out and then we have to track them and make sure we get feedback. And so uh, I think we have enough people testing for us right now, but um, the idea is that we're going to have Surefoot boot inserts this year, 2021, um, for these horses so that they can get this kind of comfort. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Ida and she can talk about some of the things she's seeing with our boot inserts. So one of the coolest things that, and this is like, Wendy and I had talked about this for quite a while before that we actually started doing the um, idea about the boot inserts, but um, one of the coolest things, and there's been lots of things, but um, 
was uh, actually Trista's on here, one of her clients. Um, we did a test with it, a uh, foundered horse, and we put mediums in it. And I'm like, and that's the one, like, you, you've got, I'm pretty sure you got all the feedback from that. But the coolest part about the feedback on that one is, I'm like, it was a pretty sore, uh, uh, chronic founder. It was not really laminitic, but it's kind of chronically foundered. But um, it tried the pads out and then gave the feedback to Trista. And, and what we found out, like preliminarily anyways, is that the comfort that the horse got from the pads being in the boot, like after the boots were off, it, re it maintained that same comfort level for two days. So like, those are things that we're pretty excited about. It's like, so like, so then again, it goes back to the, the stimuli of the receptors, the nitric oxide being produced in the feet. Um, so, and that's a lot of the things like to help laminate courses, we want like, we want the nitric oxide, you know, so, so like, again, it goes back to Dr. Bauker's research. I'm like, it's still all preliminary, but I'm like, we're pretty excited about it. Um, another one of uh, my grads, uh, her horse had uh, coffin bone penetration um, from Potomac horse fever. And it had, it had been used, like, and it was- Oh, uh, um, wait, Trista's actually giving us some, some feedback here. Um, she said okay. she actually rode him for the first time in 18 months at Christmas. Awesome. See, like, that's, that, that's like, that's happy dance stuff. Yeah, and that's just, campaign moments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm like, that's pretty cool. Thanks, T. Uh, so, um, and then another one of my grads, like um, Kim Powers had rehabbed the Potomac horse fever, uh, total coffin bone penetration on both fronts. And so then the owner now is a graduate because I'm like, she's, she's involved with what she's doing. And so she came, when she came to class, I'm like, she took some pads back home and I'm like, and it changed, like she, he had been wearing soft rides and, and the other pads and he was, he was doing well considering his condition, but she changed the pads out and he just like was a new horse. So like, it, there's, there's just something about them that, and the more like when you read uh, Dr. Barker's neural biology um, aspects of the neurons and stuff, it can, like it can help. I'm like, I don't know that it explains everything, but it, it really puts a little light on what we're trying to do, I think. Yeah. And um, the, the material is going to give to pressure. So basically in a way, it, you know, if you've ever seen a really nice dirt plug in the sole of a horse's foot, these pads are going to conform to the sole of the foot. And I think that they're, I, um, I'm not sure, but it kind of seems to me like it's basically forming that dirt plug to distribute the pressure to even it out so that you're not just getting high and low pressures, whereas other pads seem to um, not have the, the capacity to do that type of uh, very fine uh, shifts of, pre you know, like thick and thin, wherever it needs to be. And I, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that that's one of the things because the pictures people have sent me of the pads, you can see the sole of the foot, you can see the shape of, the, of where the, you know, the foot is. So um, somebody's asked me if, they'll, if these pads will be able to be used in any type of boot. Um, our goal is to create a, a size range and then have a chart that says, if you have this boot, you need this size. <laughs> That's our goal. Um, yeah. So another thing too, like that we experimented with was texture because I'm like, Dr. Bowker talks a lot about texture and um, even, even small, like, so he's done ultrasound studies of uh, horses standing on terry cloths and, and just the nubs of the terry cloth actually stimulating the, the vasodilation in the foot. So um, Wendy's experimented with that, some with the, the pads too. Yeah, um, we're less successful with that because of some modifications we're gonna have to make. I'm not sure how we're gonna do it, but we're gonna keep, we'll keep looking at that. We might not be able to have actual uh, nubbies the way we did in some of the stuff that you had just because we have to make a change in the, in the color of the surface. Yep. which is how we put the nubbies in, but that's okay. Um, you know, we're always looking, we're, we're constantly, we have, just so anybody knows, at our disposal, we have about 3,000 different kinds of foam. Um, <laughs> foam hoarder. Um, and so we're, and actually Brad's been expanding that out because he's been doing some research and, and getting more different kinds of foam. And so we're looking at how can we, you know, what is going to be the best in terms of uh, giving us the results we're looking for? And um, durability is the question, but right now what we're looking at is we'd rather make the horse more comfortable than have a pad that's more durable because durability doesn't necessarily equate with comfort. And I'm sure that everybody would rather have their horse be really comfortable for four weeks and have to buy another set of pads than buy a set of pads that's going to last for six weeks and is not comfortable. You know, um, so those are all the factors that we're 
constantly playing with in this in this testing um, to come up with uh, something that we think is going to work for the majority of horses. And that's, of course, always the, the goal is to make the most number of horses comfortable. Awesome. It's, it's challenging, you know, and it's uh, just when you think we we had this other idea and we thought, oh, we've got it totally worked out. It's working great. And we sent it off to be tested by um, a vet. And in two seconds, it failed. <laughs> and it, it failed because his surface was completely different than the surface, the ground surface that we were working on. And we hadn't taken that into our equation, right? So, um, you know, we thought we had this, uh, this other, not the boot inserts, but this other thing that's awesome as can be, but you know, until you actually send it out into the field and find out what's going to happen, you can have the best product in the world in your own barn. <laughs> well, yeah, it has to start somewhere. Yeah. Well, um, like, like you and I will need to visit because I have another um, feedback from uh, Dr. Colvin in Texas about the x-ray blocks. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, we're still waiting on our physiograph blocks, the ones with the, the physio pad built right into it. But um, I'm hoping ho I'm hoping that's the next thing they're going to ship to me. Okay. Well, one thing we got to get is um we got to get like a little uh, groove in the surface. I, well, I'll talk more, but... Yeah, we'll so talk about it. No, yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Yep. Yep. And then like one whole pad with the groove in the middle so that they're both hind feet on the, or hind or fronts, whichever the case are, are in the same height. Okay. We can talk about that. Okay, so back Just to more R and D. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. We got we've always got something to talk about. So um, this is a horse that was on. So it goes back to the century and like about what like when they're picking up something from their feet. So whether the sure foot pads are are stimulating something in the foot to help the foot, or if the foot is just basically like the 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 initial reading, no matter how you look at it. Is coming from the feet on the sure foot pads. I'm like, there's just, if there's something in the horse's back that needs to be, the horse is needing to be adjusted, but he's getting, he's getting the feedback first, or he's taking in the information first from the feet. And then that's another thing that Deb Debbie's and I do with, together with the, the a hoof and neck connection, because um, there's, there's, there's direct pathways from the feet to each cervical spine and to the spinal cord. So, so they're still picking up. And like, and I'm um, like, if I, if I get a chance, I'll send you the paper that I'm, I'm getting the stuff from Dr. Bowker too, because it, it puts everything in perspective. But um, the the spinal cord is actually being getting messages from the feet as they're they're standing on the sure foot pads. So, so I, I this video is one of the ones that we took at the the class that we had with you in Illinois. Um, yeah, so it feels like a million years ago. Wow. We did it though. Just getting a lot of voices. Yeah. So you can start, you see that horse is just- he's, Can you kill the sound on the video? I don't know how to. Um, see on the right hand side, there you go. Just drop it right down. There Perfect. we go. There. Because the video is not uh, moving quite at speed. It's a little bit broken up. That's the problem, one of the problems with Zoom. But I think what we can see, I, you know, the horse is swaying and that's what the rider is pointing out. And if anybody's wondering why we're doing this with a rider on board, because, you know, I always say, what do you like when you visit your mother? And what do you like when you visit your friends? You, you change depending on the environment. So the environment of having tack and being, having a rider on your back, you're going to have a different pattern than if you're, you know, really comfy and in your bedroom slippers and watching TV. Um, and so it's important to address that pattern in the environment in which it would be elicited and also for the rider to feel what happens with the horse because there's so many subtle little things can you play that video again ida um so many subtle little things that happen that you might not visually see but if you're sitting on the horse you're going to feel and that changes the rider's perception of the horse which is the most important thing because unless we change the rider's perception or the owner's perception the horse isn't going to be able to change so watch his ears, his face, and his breathing. And there's rib cage movement. See, there goes his ears. I did a little tweak in yep, his he head. He does a little head twiggle. <laughs> and yeah. then you can tell she fell something because she's got her thumb pointing. Yeah, that video is, it's not playing smoothly, but just hit it one more. You know what, Ida? Grab the the video bar and just slowly drag it. And um, sometimes that's, um, you might have to grab it from the, yeah, there you go. 
and just draw it and see if that, because a lot of times I'll do that and you'll see a lot more when yeah, you I'm going back and forth with it. See right here, you can really see, like if you watch his head. Yep, he I sways left and then from right to left, yep. There's a little change in his ears. See, like he almost like he could just barely detect that he he bobbed his head a little. Yep. And you can see how his rib cage is more to the left, but it changes somewhere in here. It changes. Yeah. Right there was a just little little change. He shifted yep. his classic sling right there. See that yep. back and forth. Just a little deep breath right there. And then somewhere here he does that head. Right, so just as she's starting to feel something, watch his head and his ears. See his ears? Yep. And right here, he's like. Yeah, he does that little, and, and that's a very common thing to see, that little movement up at the top of the neck in the pole, C1, C2. Very common to see that. What's exciting about it is, is if you read those two, um, if you read those two quotes that Dr. Bowker talks about, and uh, and how that they perceive things through the appropriate receptors and the different, like in, in, in that paper, he's got actually the whole hoof connected up into uh, 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 nerve endings and where they go and which nerves actually go to the central, uh, the the spinal cord, and so if you take just that little piece of information, and you have this horse that's standing on two sure foot pads on the front and he's got the sand in the back which he's used to but he's feeling the difference in his environment and in his perception on the sure foot pads on the front it's he's he's actually talking to his complete body through through the, he starts off that he's receiving the information from his feet and they are they are transferring the information throughout his body all the way to the spinal cord yeah and you know he's We've seen so many um, different kinds of changes, but I, you know, I've seen horses where, uh, I'm, in fact, I'm thinking of one in particular whose pelvis was so unlevel, and he stood on hard pads under his back feet. It's all he wanted, but he stood on them really quiet for five minutes. And when he came back in the afternoon, his pelvis was level. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and he just took that information and processed it. And um, you know, if you have circuits, just like people, there are circuits that just reflects to the spinal cord and back down, right? Um, they look at that, I, I can't tell you the research exactly, but um, you know, when they're looking at people who are quadra and paraplegic, there, there is work being done to try and figure out how to get those um, sensory motor sensors in the spinal cord to trigger the movement. So not everything has to go all the way to the brain to have a motor pattern effect, but of course the brain is coordinating and organizing everything. So you know, we could be affecting those, uh, I've forgotten what they're called. Can you help me out? I don't remember. I, I know what you're talking about because it's in the paper. So I, I was into that paper because he talks about all of that because there, there, are, there are some things that never enter, enter into thought or at all, but they're, they're, they're I don't want to say reactions, but they're, they're, they're uh, he had a name for them too. I don't remember. It's like it movement either. generators or something like that. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, might, it popped to me probably when we're done, but I'm, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, I think one of the things that we have to marvel at is just how intricate this system is, whether it's a horse or a person, any mammal, is, is how unbelievably intricate it is and how exquisite it is in terms of, of not making mistakes. You know, like, yeah, we make some mistakes once in a while. We miss a step or we bite our cheek or something like that. But the thousands and thousands and thousands of times we don't make mistakes that the system is so yes. well organized and so attuned. And then, you know, if something gets only a tiny bit out of whack, it doesn't take a lot because it's so fine tuned, but a tiny bit out of whack and it can start causing uh, missteps or misorganizations, you know, like... Um, you think about walking down the stairs and and you catch your toe and 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 how and then how you organize to stop yourself from falling it's just amazing but the, how many times have you gone down the stairs and not caught your toe um 
it's, exactly. it's, it's amazing. We are amazing. Horses are amazing. And, and um, I think that's one of the things and why this is so fascinating because as um, there's so many different levels that it's hitting because, you know, one of the things that I've thought about, Ida, and maybe uh, you have some input on it, but, you know, we get horses that are in boots and the boots are, you know, pretty rigid. They're not very flexible. And yet we still see the same kind of effects as we see with unshod horses and shod horses. And a million times I get the question, you know, does it matter if they're shot or unshod? And the answer is no, they're still responding to surefoot pads. So the, it has to be something much more global than, than that, uh, you know? Yeah, I agree. And so, so going back, so like, like my, my original, so just like you guys know, I'm like, I had, I had an opportunity to have one of these pads a long time ago. And I'm, I was a skeptic because I'm like, okay, how are these pads going to do this and that? And, and so then like, and this is my bullheaded self. And I'm like, this is bad me. And I'm already saying that right off because, but um, I had the pads and I watched the video and the, 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 the first video slide had a horse that had terrible feet. I'm like, he was in shoes and like, and I'm, and I'm already telling you, I'm a hard head and, and sometimes not so smart about things, but I, like, like when you put him on the pads and my first thing is, it's like, What's the point? I'm like, if they just fix the speed, he wouldn't need the pads. So I'm like, so sorry about that. But, but I'm like, I, okay. I, had go, I had to go through my motion of denying everything first. So then, so then as I become more uh, educated biomechanically for the whole horse and the intrinsic system and, and all that kind of stuff, um, like I realized that, you know, so the got brought up, I was at a um, Jillian Kreinbring class and she was talking about um, improving proprioceptors by walking your horses on mattresses. And I'm like, oh, that would be a really good thing for the Murdoch pads. I'm like, oh, why didn't I just like, like you know, just stupid stuff. So I'm like, I called one of I'm like, hey, I'm like, uh, can I like check out your pads again? <laughs> so, so all that blah, blah, blah. And just to say that my theory behind what it works no matter what is because no matter what, okay, so that, say that there's a boot on the foot and say that, that the horse is standing in, in the boot on the pad even in his boots on the pad, it still changes his reality. So I'm like, he is not changing. He's not, it, it doesn't feel to him like he's barefoot on the pad. The of his receptors, because he's went from standing on his, his new constant of the boots, and then he's put it on a pad, which stimulates the appropriate receptors because it's a new, it's an, it's, it's, uh, so like what you were saying earlier, it's like, if, it, if you're in something all the time, yeah. um, it, it loses its sensation. So that's why these work no matter what, because it can be, it can be in a, a two foot tall boot for that matter. And that's the horse's normal. That's his everyday life. But then when you offer him different sensations, I'm like, this is the cool part about the body is it wakes up immediately because there's new sensation in the hood, <laughs> you know, like he's, he's got his, and, and same with shoes. It's like, and the cool part like getting over my bullheadedness about the shoes. The cool part about the pads and, and, and the horses with terrible feet in the shoes, not that all horses in shoes are terrible feet, but the, 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 like my early bullheaded self is like these horses have got these like God awful apparatuses on their feet and they're on the pad, but the pads are forgiving. I'm like, so, so this horse that has had, like if, if he's had a good shoe job or a bad shoe job, it doesn't make any difference which, but he's had that on his feet and yet that's his normal, but then you put him on the pads and it changes his, his sensation. And the cool part about, to me about the horses is they change their sensation and they choose where to put their foot where they need the change. So yeah. the horse may put just his toe on the pad or he might just put his heel on the pad, but the horse still knows where he would like the change. I'm like, his, like wherever he's at in his space and time, he, he would like a change and, and that's, he picks it. And, and there's something, you know, I, I've always tried to grapple my head around the fact that we, we've spent so much money on footing. I mean, you think about some of these arenas you've been in, right? Yeah. We spend so much money on footing and yet, I mean, maybe it's because it's the same everywhere. The whole, all the footing is the same. And that's why we don't see this kind of change. Cause you know, I walk in with my little foam pad and I stick it under a horse's foot on this incredible footing and voila, <laughs> amazing changes. Um, but I think it is the contrast. I think you're right about that, but that's a huge part of it. I think so. Yep. 
Well, this is really cool. And it's really cool to see how you're tying together this, this whole idea of, I'll have to ask Dr. Bowker when he comes on about the nitrous oxide and the release of nitrous oxide and get his thoughts on that because the, um, it's really interesting. I don't know if you saw the webinar I had the other day about CO2. So there's a, a treatment and we're actually doing this with Al as an experiment um, where you uh, use a medical grade CO2, you put a bag on the leg, Dr. Herman and, and Steve Macklin uh, did the webinar, um, and then you fill it full of medical grade CO2. And the reason medical grade, because it doesn't have any impurities, you don't wanna be sending impurities into your horse like mercury and crap like that, right? So it's medical grade CO2, but what that CO2 is doing is it's causing the body to respond by sending more oxygen to the area because the nervous system is reporting, hey, there's too much CO2 here. So now we have to send oxygen and then we get an increase in angiogenesis or increase in blood vessels and blood flow, but increase in making new blood vessels. So, you know, in the same way, I'm wondering if the um, NO, NO is, is another gaseous chemical that's causing a similar kind of thing as the CO2 is saying, hey, you need to send more oxygen down here. We're, we need more because uh, we have too high a level of, of this other thing. The, the body is so amazing, isn't it? So incredible. It's, yeah. it's, <laughs> I'm like, it's like a rabbit hole though, because it's like, I, I haven't got to watch your CO2 guy yet. I'm like, um, I, I have been working, but I want to try to catch that this week. But uh, all these things is every little piece. And then some of the things that we never knew what was happening, but it's just like, that's how I describe the pads. It's like, and that's why I'm on a quest to at least make, like, I have to make sense of things. So I, I love you, it. You, can see, you can see things, you can see things working and I'm like, absolutely I advocate them because I've seen them do awesome things, but my mind can't just let that go because I'm like, okay, so now I have to understand why, why are they working? <laughs> that's so. why I'm up to a number 100 and 46 webinars because <laughs> really when I started this, you know, it was like, okay, we have a pandemic. Now I can get a hold of people. And I've, you know, my big question's always been, how do you think this is working? And, uh, you know, I, 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 we've got lots of great ideas. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever have definitive answers, but we certainly have lots of great ideas and we can see lots of different pieces falling together um, to help uh, make sense of it because Ida, as you know, that was like my first thought was, how is this working? And that's, I'm on a nine year journey. <laughs> yeah, we'll get something figured out. And we might not have everything figured out, but like we can come up with some pretty good theories. I've learned a lot about feet. I've learned a lot about feet, awesome. you know, in this process. Uh, and um, it's, it's really great. And I've been able to share this with everybody else. So, um, all right, I think we're, we'll wrap this up then, Ida. You good? Yep, my last slide, other than the, the quote I had already showed you guys, but I mean, that'd be, I'm like, I'm, I'm good with you using the PowerPoint on the, uh, you know, with the, I mean, I think you record it anyway, so it'd be on there. Yeah, so. it's on the recording. All right, just go ahead and unshare your screen and we'll wrap this up. And if anybody has any questions, now's the time to ask. And uh, just pop them in the chat or the Q&A. And if I don't get any questions, we'll just wrap it up. So, cause it's getting late for me. <laughs> You're turn into a pumpkin. I'm just waking up. <laughs> no, uh, I, need, I need my beauty rest. <laughs> In that case, I'm going to have to sleep longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you, Ida, for coming back. It's really great to see you. I've missed, I missed not seeing you this past year in person, um, um, but ooh. hopefully soon that will change and we'll be able to get together. And, and uh, in the meantime, um, everybody, you can find this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Please tell your friends where to find these videos because we, our number one question is, is this recorded? And yes, yeah. they are all recorded. So just tell your friends they're recorded. Just go to the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel, subscribe. You'll get a notification with every webinar we post. And thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you all later this week. Awesome. Thanks, Wendy. Right. Thanks. Great to see you. Say hi to Ada for me. She's inside, but she goes to have back. Okay, bye. bye. <laughs> yeah.